So we're just going to get started in a minute. We're going to give everyone a minute just to sign in. We're excited to see where everyone is joining us from today as well. So please feel free to say hello in the chat. We love to see it. Just a friendly reminder too that when you are joining us in the chat discussion, um, there is a blue toggle there that allows you to select between host and panelists or everyone. Do please make sure you select everyone so that the other um, attendees can see your comments as well. Yay, it's so much fun to see the chat window bursting forward and from all over the world too. I think I saw Belgium, Belgium, the UK, I, Nantucket, British Columbia. It's great. Um, so I want to remind you too that as we get started, um, please feel free to join in conversation about um, the discussion today in the chat. It's a great way to add another layer and, and more depth to the conversation. And as you have questions for the actual panel, please direct those into the Q&A window, which is separate from the chat. Um, that'll make it easier for me to keep track of questions specifically for the panel and to integrate them into the discussion as we go or address them at the end. Um, so as you, uh, many of you already know that this is the second session in a five part series looking at this decade of action. So we um, started the series a couple of weeks ago now focused on carbon, carbon and climate action. And today we're going to be looking at what we can do in relation to water. We're really talking about water systems and water management. And um, we'll be having that discussion in relation to habitat, vineyard, and wineries today. Um, the next session I'll remind you too is on soil and farming. I know last time a lot of people were really excited to talk about farming and we, we can mention things that do tie in in that regard in relation to water, but we'll get far more in depth in that next, um, next session in early October. Now, looking back to the first session on carbon and climate, I had personally, I had three key takeaways. One of the things I really appreciate about this series is that I'm getting to learn so much too, which I really value. And kind of looking back at my three key takeaways from last session, I'd love to hear anybody else's in the chat as well as you, as you are interested in sharing those. But my three key takeaways um, were that you cannot manage what you do not measure. I think it's a really important um, point for all of us in the wine industry to remember that in order to manage and make change, you have to actually measure what you have and, um, and how you're working with it. We'll talk about that in today as well in relation to water um, specifically. One of the things that really um, stood out to me as well is that, um, you know, some of the media have really taken a strong view. Jancis Robinson is one example in relation to the weight of glass bottles. And some of the pushback has been, oh, well, you have to have heavier bottles because that's what consumers respond to. But actually one of the points that came up um, briefly in the last session and thinking back really stood out as quite important to me was that um, the Kendall, entire Kendall Jackson brand and La Crema brand both lightweighted their bottles and made a point of choosing to do that without drawing attention to it. They simply went ahead and made the change. And as uh, many of us know, the Kendall Jackson Vintners Reserve Chardonnay has been the top selling Chardonnay in the United States for almost 30 years now. And in making this change to light weighting bottles, um, Jackson Family Wines was able to reduce their total carbon emissions by almost 4% um, simply by making lighter weight bottles. And that's a reduction both on the production of the glass as well as the transportation of that glass. But so for the entire company to reduce their emissions by almost 4% just by light weighting bottles is pretty remarkable. But the point I wanna make is that they received zero pushback from consumers on those lighter weight bottles. And what that tells us is that actually the skepticism we've had as an industry about what, what consumers want and need is not necessarily the case in glass, that it is possible for more of us to think about light weighting glass and having a positive impact in that way. And then the third thing that really stuck in my mind from the last session is just that a point that Kim made that no change is too small. We need to each be thinking about what we can do to contribute. 
But also in the session as a whole, my big takeaway was that for us to make an impact as an industry, we have to collaborate. And that's what I hope we'll really think about today. You know, as a wine industry, we tend to be very traditional, very skeptical, and, um, and very competitive. And for our decade of action to really make a change in relation to these issues to matter, we have to turn to thinking in terms of innovation, being constructive, and being collaborative. And so that's what I'd really like us to think about today. How can we find those who are being innovative, constructive, and collaborative, and use that mindset to come up with solutions to work together? So today, though, I'm really grateful for the three people that we have on the panel, because the, the backbone of their work and their perspective is very much based in those three things. And, um, and so I'm really thankful for the time I've been able to spend with each of them learning and, and to put this session together for all of us to learn together. So first of all, we have Katie Jackson, who is a second generation proprietor, proprietor of Jackson Family Wines and also serves as the senior vice president of corporate social responsibility, um, dealing with sustainability specifically, government relations, and also the philanthropy work that, um, that the company does as well. Uh, Dan Wilson is the division manager of the West Coast Division of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, as we call it, um, also serves as the operations and policy branch chief, is a fisheries biologist, and partners with regional groups, businesses, landowners, resource agencies, and tribes on conservation and habitat. Dr. Roger Bolton is Professor Emeritus of UC Davis in Viticulture and Enology and took a lead role in designing the Jess Jackson Sustainable Winery Building, which is a state-of-the-art teaching and production winery there on campus and one of the most sustainable wineries in the world. He has also partnered in research and consulted um, for regions and wineries on these issues worldwide. Um, now, as we move into the discussion, I'd like to just make a few brief comments in relation to ways to think about the issue of water. What I've tended to see from media discussions and kind of industry conversations is that we tend to think about the issue of water as a simple means of um, reduction of our use, as if, we're, if we just use less, we'll be better off. We also tend to talk quite a bit about drought, of course, especially here in California. But what I'd want us to try to do today is to just rethink the whole way that we approach this conversation about water and to really understand that to make a difference on these issues, we have to be thinking holistically, thinking about water systems and specifically about water management, water quality, water value, which we're going to get into a little bit um, later, and also water storage. And one simple analogy that I think can help make a sense of this idea that we're really need to think holistically in terms of water systems is something that uh, Dr. Bolton helped me better understand. And so Roger, I was hoping that you could make that analogy that we really can think of water in terms of banking and that that helps give us a clearer picture of, of our role and, and um, how we can interact with it. Could you go ahead and give us that analogy to help us get started? Certainly, Elaine. Um... The sense of, as the financial analysis would be, we would talk about deposits, we talk about withdrawals, we talk about account balances, we talk about cash flow, and we talk about savings and investments. And so often since we've got to speak with financial entities about projects related to water and energy, we need to have an energy and a water and carbon and chemistry, but the water one particularly what are the withdrawals? What are the deposits? What's in the account? How do we sort uh, for say for a future for a rainy day? Excuse the pun. <laughs> so that sense of a of a, of an account, I think, is what we need to talk about, whether it be for vineyards or for wineries. Right. So how we're literally using water would be a withdrawal, and how we're storing water would be a deposit. Would that be a simple way to? Well, it'd be a deposit, but it'd also be adding to the storage or to the balance. Mm -hmm. And there'll be times when we actually want to take more out than we put in, and there'll be times when we want to put more back than we take out. So the, the cash flows will shift across the year and the season, but we still want to maintain a balance on an annual basis. And we can even have water savings and water investment then. 
That's right. That's right. And um, so we can we can touch on all of those as as the group wants. That's great. So so just keep that in mind, this idea of like in rethinking water, we need to be thinking about complete systems. We need to have a holistic picture and using a banking analogy is one way to help us better do that. So as we go forward in the discussion today, we're going to kind of um, talk about these issues again in relation to um, uh, habitat vineyard and um, winery and and that analogy can come in in different kinds of ways um, one of the things that jocelyn's bringing up too is that what a point is also access to water and that's something that we need to think about in terms of communities and as we go forward in this series i want to remind us that we do have an entire session just on social responsibility so that kind of question is really relevant there as well but we can touch on it today so starting with habitat um, dan one of the things that came up in the discussions you and I had was just the simple point that climate change is not just about temperatures going up. Climate change has actually affected all of our weather systems and um, in many parts of the world has created a different kind of awareness of storm fronts and storm systems. Here in California, one of the things I just started hearing about in the last few years was this idea of an atmospheric river. When being here and experiencing an atmospheric river is outrageously intense, but it turns out that this sort of, this point that these climate phenomenon directly inform what Roger was just talking about with our, our access to water and our water availability, but it's actually changed, um, what we all need to be doing in terms of thinking about this point of water storage and how we bank water. So could you tell us a little, let's just start there. Tell us a little bit more about, again, climate change means we have to be thinking in terms of anticipating storms and using those for our water storage down the road. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? Make, help us make sense of that. Yeah, thanks, Laura, uh, Elaine. So. I think just to start out with some basic knowledge, just think of an atmospheric river as the biggest cash flow you could ever imagine in your life. And it's, it's raining cash from the sky. Uh, it's a, atmospheric river is, a, um, is, is basically a river of water vapor pushed by the wind. And uh, uh, climate uh, models have shown that um, um, these uh, atmospheric rivers hit within a local geographic area. And uh, one thing that we can expect with climate change in California at least, is that we'll see wider fluctuations between significantly wet years and significantly dry years. And it's becoming more and more important to uh, react um, when these atmospheric rivers occur. And it's, it's one thing that uh, we've had uh, recent success with uh, Lake Mendocino um, and Mendocino County and being able to um, just make operational changes um, in, in um, anticipation of an atmospheric river. Uh, one initiative that uh, NOAA has done with the, uh, the Army Corps of the Engineers and uh, Sonoma County Water Agency is an effort called uh, Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations. And um, it, it played out significantly this year. Um, one thing that uh, we were able to do in uh, the winter of 19 and 20 is make an operational change to Lake Mendocino and uh, bank um, water from that, uh, from an atmospheric river that happened in February. And um, the results have shown that we were able to capitalize on 20% additional storage uh, in the spring of, of 2020. And that's significant uh, for that reservoir. It actually equivalents, it, it, it's equivalent to about 12,000 acre feet of water. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put that in context because right now Lake Mendocino is less than 20,000 acre feet of water. So we've been able to essentially be able to carry over that storage. And um, I really think there's water in Lake Mendocino today in part because of that carryover storage that occurred um, by a simple operational change that uh, required no investment in, in infrastructure. So I wanna just clarify this example a little bit. My understanding is that historically, the way that 
a reservoir of this size and scope would work. So again, a big regional reservoir was, it used to be that, okay, well, we're going to use the reservoir to help prevent flooding in these areas. And so we'll capture water in, um, you know, until it's full, so to speak, and then slowly release it outside of rain events. And, and it was never really, it was not as much about storage as it was about managing flood and a little bit of storage. But what the shift that I understand has been made recently is recognizing these reservoirs are a necessary long-term solution to water storage as well. And so how to manage the opening and closing the floodgates, to put it very simply, is a big part of the effort now. Yeah, you're exactly right. So uh, Lake Mendocino, it's a lot of our uh, water infrastructure um, throughout the West is, um, is very old, decades old, in some cases, nearly 100 years old. And um, in many cases, some of their operations are just as old too. So in the matter of Lake Mendocino, that reservoir was primarily designed for flood control, uh, where it would um, hold back water um, and allow the, the, the river to pass its flow. And then Lake Mendocino would then release water and then um, uh, immediately afterwards, um, depleting its storage, uh, regardless of when the next storm event came. And so now we're thinking with, you know, climate change uh, that and, um, you know, modeling uh, has improved a lot that um, we need really need to be more careful about um, how we release those floodwaters because it could be, um, you know, uh, six to eight to even years before a, a neck, the next atmosphere river comes in. And um, we need to be more mindful about sort of carryover storage from year to year. Um, climate forecasting is gonna become a, a, a significant tool for water management, not only for flood control, but um, water supply. And historically that dynamic between water supply and flood control has been um, um, at odds with one another. Yeah, so historically as a, just a, there's so much information <laughs> to try to fit into this short session. So forgive me for doing some, some summaries along the way. But historically, climate change, um, uh, climate modeling has been focused just on temperature. But the, the limitation of that is it does not anticipate um, variability across time. And so the shift has now been to tracking climate changes over time and then tracking storm systems over time as well, so that we can better predict the years where we're going to have excess storm and rain activity versus reduced storm and rain activity. Now, one of the things that I'm going to, again, sum up very quickly um, uh, is just the idea that we have often thought about water storage as almost surface water storage. So literal reservoirs that look like ponds or lakes on the surface, as well as water tanks. Something though that Dan has talked to me about is um, that actually water banking needs to happen in the land itself as well. And Katie, you have actually worked with research researchers specifically on this question of how, can we bank water in the land itself and thereby recharge groundwater itself and also actually eventually the aquifer as well. And so at La Crema, you've actually partnered with researchers on this exact question. So could you tell us more about how you have been working on groundwater recharge efforts there at La Crema, what that looks like and, and what the results have been? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, but first, uh, I'd love to take a step back really quickly and just um, talk a little bit about um, our how we think about water at Jackson Family Lines. Um, and um, historically, um, I would say we've been thinking about um, the importance of water management um, in addition to water conservation um, as being really critical um, to, as a way to frame our thinking. Um, and starting in the early um, 1990s um, was when my, my father and my mother first started um, building reservoirs so we could capture um, rainfall during um, rainfall events in the winter um, when water was plentiful. And then, um, we're utilizing that water throughout the year um, so that we could um, reduce our impacts on streams or groundwater at times when there was less water available and, um, and more need um, for water. 
Um, so um, really critical um, to how we've kind of addressed water in the past um, has been water conservation. Um, and we've deployed um, some new technologies and we've asked our, our teams at our wineries to really um, prioritize water conservation. And overall, we've been able to reduce um, the amount of water we use to make a bottle of wine by about 42% since 2008. Um, but going forward, our goal and our, um, our, our way of um, addressing water um, in order to be more resilient in the face of climate change um, and um, these changing conditions that you and Dan were just um, talking about is the fact that we really need to be thinking about um, water more holistically. So thinking about um, groundwater and our impacts on um, overall aquifer levels, um, thinking about the impacts on um, the streams that um, go next to our creeks and, um, and really just thinking about um, holistically how um, we have an impact. Um, and so this, this trial that you were just asking about, um, our groundwater recharge trial, um, is one of the more innovative um, solutions to, um, to this um, concern over uh, water availability and, and, um, and consistency of water availability um, that climate change is kind of throwing into question. Um, and so basically the concept is that we're taking water um, at a time when it's, when it's plentiful um, and we're flooding our um, vineyards, which are dormant during the winter. Um, and then we are measuring um, how much water we can put back into the aquifer um, throughout the course of the year um, by doing this, um, this practice and then um, calculating how much we're taking out and we're, we're trying to reach um, net um, recharge over, over use. Um, and so um, I think the, the, the key things about this that are really um, critical are that uh, we're going to be able um, as agricultural um, producers to, to um, as Roger was talking about, put some deposits back into our overall um, groundwater landscape um, and um, rely upon that um, in drier years um, uh, by planning um, for, for recharge um, possibilities in years when there's water that is is plentifully available, um, such as when we have these atmospheric rivers and other things that bring. Yeah, thank you. I love this example too, because again, I think we, we do need to think in terms of water storage, you know, with, with literal reservoirs like po uh, pond and lake looking reservoirs, but also in terms of storage tanks. But again, this point that we also need to be banking water in the site itself and that in a place like California, we can afford to do that in the winter um, when vines are dormant, dormant and we have a lot, of, a lot of water availability. And, you know, Dan, I know um, one of the questions that came in um, in the discussion and also that ties directly into a project you and Katie have worked on together, um, you know, one of your particular interests is, is on salmon habitats and salmon conservation. And so you and Katie actually work together to do strategic water release. Um, so it's a, it's a different version of what Katie's been talking about. So Katie's talking about intentionally releasing water into a landscape in the winter months to help do groundwater recharge. But one of the things you have worked on with Katie as well is just this idea of strategically releasing water in order to ensure that in the drier months, the tributaries um, for, for the fish habitat stay actually intact. So could you tell us a little more about that and how landowners can be thinking about that as well? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we found one of the things that we learned about through the uh, the last drought, California's last drought uh, between 2013, uh, 2012 to uh, 2016, was that um, you know some of these small ponds and um, off-stream water storage really could be a valuable tool in keeping fish alive during the summertime, and um, that uh, we, we uh, worked with Katie on making, um, Katie and her family on make, and some other landowners on making small releases to streams on the order of, um, that could be measured in terms of, you know, cups per, cups per minute or gallons per minute, just minimal releases. And essentially what that allowed us to do is, is uh, it, it prevented us from conducting um, 
extraordinary amounts of fish rescues um, and collecting fish and bringing them in the hatchery where we really had limited space and would have brought other issues. Uh, but it kept fish alive throughout that entire drought where they would not have been alive otherwise. We were running to, into a situation where we could have lost an entire cohort of, of fish, multiple cohorts, if it weren't for those releases. And so these small releases um, really are important in, in, in drought situations just to get fish through the summer uh, while we're trying to manage, um, you know, uh, other systematic problems like over withdrawals and um, channel incision um, uh, factors that, um, you know, cause us to lose water over time. But um, the, the partnerships that we've had with, with Katie and others in the community uh, were, were critical in um, getting um, threatened and endangered populations of salmon and steelhead through that last drought and, and even this drought for that matter. Yeah, so just to address the question that came up from Lynn and Mark in the chat. So we can actually use this intentional water capture during high rain events to strategically release water during the drier parts of the year in order to preserve habitat. But I know Katie, you know, the Kellogg Ranch is actually something that's personally really important to you and has helped inspire your work in, um, in uh, sustainability efforts overall. Could you tell us just a little bit about, about that project and how you and Dan work together? Sure, so um, the Kellogg Ranch um, Safe Harbor that we worked on with um, Dan and, and Noah um, and also um, Cal California Department of Fish and Wildlife and, um, and uh, Trout Unlimited, which is a nonprofit um, uh, assisted as well, um, was uh, really designed to find um, a way for us as a landowner to collaborate with um, and a resource agency and have this public par um, private partnership um, to have a beneficial impact on overall um, the overall health of the habitat for fish. And so um, it, it was one of those things where we were able to change the way that we managed how we took water um, from the stream. Um, and we had this very antiquated um, water conveyance system on that site um, that was dated back to, I think, um, 1910 or something. Um, and um, by working with Dan um, and his team at NOAA, um, we were able to identify um, uh, grant funding um, to be able to take out this barrier to fish uh, passage up the stream, um, which was really, um, really a great um, benefit for, for the fish because the two miles just upstream of um, that barrier, which were partially on our property and then partially on our, our neighbors, um, was pristine habitat um, for coho, and um, and this barrier was just preventing them from being able to access it. Um, so uh, by by working with Noah on this, um, we were able to do something that had no impact on on how we operate our vineyards. Um, uh, it, it basically just allowed us to, um, to change how we were taking water in a way that was more in line with how much water we actually needed, um, and then um, to remove this barrier. And um, those two things um, together um, made a big impact on, on that creek. Um, and I'm sure Dan can, can speak maybe a little bit more to why that creek is important, but um, it, those are the type of uh, projects that um, as landowners, we're really excited to um, collaborate on because, um, because there are a lot of um, streams that are on uh, private landowners' property, and, um, and there's a way that working together can have um, this overall benefit that far exceeds um, anything that any individual landowner could potentially do on their property um, without the expertise um, uh, of the agencies. So. Yeah, thank you. I want to pause this just for a second to, in order to, Roger, I'd li love to bring you in here just briefly to address a question that Jonathan brought up in chat. Because So Katie was talking about being able to do groundwater recharge by um, you know, essentially flood irrigating a site in the winter. But as we know, different soil types respond to this in different ways. And so Jonathan's asking um, if we can comment briefly on just kind of that 
what we should know about water holding capacity and these kinds of sort of recharge efforts. Um, do you have any comments about that, Roger, that you'd yep. like to add? Yeah. Yep. So firstly, it's yeah. it's gotta be very site specific, but um, it's fairly well understood in, in soil chemistry, the water holding capacity of different types of soils. And some uh, swell up when they get wet and become impermeable. Clay, for example, and clay content affects that. Sandy soils at the other spectrum are quite permeable. So the practice now has to be related to what soil type you have and to what degree you can or can't hold. Um, but you would want to know that number. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are tests that can be done to determine how an application of water either sits or drains in a particular site that would give you that information. And, um, and that's doable on a, um, today and it would be part of a water balance that we'd want to understand. Yeah, so it's great. So what what La Crema has done is give a really fantastic example of how we can be banking water in particular sites, but the actual results are going to be very site by site depending on the conditions of that particular place. So coming back to this this um, discussion about habitat, and you know, Katie, you were so nicely making the point that these you know these habitat restorations like updating the water system and removing barriers for salmon actually can have a big benefit for the site as a whole. You know, Dan, you, something that you and I have talked about that I think is so fascinating. I, you know, salmon safe is an example of a certification that a winery can, can have and actually even put a little stamp on their bottle to show that, that their vineyard and their winery is salmon safe. And I think sometimes when we're talking about sustainability efforts, we start to assume it's, be, it's for moral reasons that we're trying to prove we're good people. But actually, salmon and fish in general end up being a really powerful demonstration of the overall health of a habitat so that they're actually um, kind of, you know, one of the comments people make with vineyards is, oh, you plant roses next to vines because roses tell you about issues before the vine does. But similarly, salmon or other fish start to tell you about the health of the habitat before other things are more obvious. Something that we have been learning is that we actually have to shift our perspective on agriculture. Historically, we've tended to assume, well, we should plant every single possible piece of land available to get the most crop back. But we've actually found that for the long-term health of a crop, we actually have to balance and uh, maximize our agricultural use in relation to maximizing the habitat health. And so this example that Katie was getting into with restoring um, the waterways, preserving the habitat and doing conservation is an example of bringing that conversation between the ag need and the habitat need together. Can you, so I just gave you a really complicated <laughs> question to address. Can you help us better understand why it really is business smart to balance our agricultural needs with the habitat needs of our particular sites for, for those of us that are landowners? Yeah, thanks, Elaine. I, I think I understand the question. And I, I, I wanna cover two examples. I wanna first talk about Kellogg. It's a really fun example to talk about. And, but let's first get into why you know, salmon and steelhead are, are, are sort of this indicator species of, of problems to come. Um, salmon and steelhead require cold, clean water uh, virtually all year round. And you know, people require water, um, maybe not so cold and uh, maybe not so clean in some respects, but as salmon and steel populations start to decline because of water issues, you know, we could expect some problems with our, um, with, uh, uh, our needs that depend on water too. Um, water quality is an issue with us uh, if, if salmon and steel can't survive there. It really is a, uh, an important issue. We were able to maximize beneficial uses for steelhead and salmon and um, uh, you know, wine growing on uh, Kellogg Ranch because we were able to match up uh, uh, water needs for the, 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 the ranch and water needs for the, the fisheries. So we were able to um, set up a, a, water, uh, a, 
a water diversion schedule that capitalized on high storm events uh, when waterfall, water is plentiful for all resources. Um, the Jacksons will, you know, divert during high st storm events um, and uh, fish are able to uh, pass into uh, essentially prime uh, habitat uh, upstream of the diversion weir because we were able to uh, create a fish passage uh, structure there. Um, that's a that's a good example. It's not the only example. And you know the other example I have is one that is really fun. It, and it recognizes some of the symbiosis between wine and and salmon and steelhead. And uh, there's a, a really good study by Joe Mertz and Peter Moyle on the uh, Calaveras River in California, where it found that uh, where uh, salmon spawned in the river, um, the marine derived nutrients from their carcasses uh, actually showed up in uh, the adjacent uh, riparian area and in the um, and in the grapes, and it, that's it, I, it's my understanding that's a that's a valuable thing is to have some of that foliar nitrogen um, in the vines. Um, so there is a, uh, a beneficial use there. And the other thing is is like how do we maximize that beneficial use uh, between the two? Well, um, one of the things Roger talked about was the value of water banking and floodplains. We also know from uh, a, a, a lot of uh, scientific literature over the last 20 years that the highest growth rates of salmon and steelhead occur when they're on the floodplain um, during the spring and summer. And a, a key indicator of salmon survival is, and steelhead survival is their size before ocean entry. And so if we can get fish uh, rearing on the floodplain, and banking water uh, for um, extraction later on, that is a, a, a real win-win um, scenario for both growers and fishery users. The catch is, is that um, what we need to do is, is, is spend a lot of work in transforming the in-stream habitat because historical practices have often maximized the land for farming by narrowing the riparian corridor in order to um, increase so essentially make, making the river more contained and narrow and reducing the uh, the area the water can seep into to put it simply yeah that's exactly it so we really need the water to during these storm events to um, spread out a larger surface area um, that's how fish access them access floodplains and utilize them with enough time to grow and return back to the stream. In these narrow um, confined channels, it's very difficult not only to get flooding, but to get fish up on up on those floodplains in a safe way. Right. So again, one of the point that I want to make sure is being heard here is that this isn't, we're not just doing this to be good to salmon, that actually salmon and steelhead end up being an indication of the health of the habitat which is going to also affect our health in the long run as well so by rethinking how we allow waterways to be intact in relation to habitats and our land um, we're actually making ourselves more resilient in the long run too so katie though I, this is sometimes a challenge for landowners this idea of collaborating with something like resource agencies and rethinking our egg use you know so can you give us some examples you know you as a family have been committed to stewardship from the beginning, um, but can you give us some examples about like, how are you doing this now? What are, what is it some, another landowner can keep in mind in terms of striking that balance of habitat and agriculture? We, um, yeah, we have always um, thought about our, our properties as kind of the whole ecosystem and, um, my um, dad used to say, take care of the land and it will take care of you. So we kind of had that longer term perspective that um, if we were attending to the health of our soils, to the health of um, the land that we were farming and the surrounding ecosystems, that it would be beneficial for the long term. Um, and so um, when we um, look at how we farm, we try to keep uh, a lot of our lands unplanted so that we can preserve the biodiversity um, of the properties um, surrounding the vineyards. And um, we put in um, wildlife corridors um, 
or just leave leave the wildlife corridors intact. Um, and um, one of the things that I'm excited about that we're going to be um, doing is, is um, as part of our um, 2030 goals um, for this Rooted for Good um, campaign is we're also going to start thinking about how we can promote biodiversity um, on our properties by um, planting um, plants that are beneficial for, um, for bees and other insects and um, how we can kind of bolster, you know, the overall health of the um, biodiversity of the land. Um, I think one thing that Dan um, said that was really um, important um, uh, is the idea that um, we need to take our water um, when we get it and um, slow it and spread it and sink it. And um, by doing that, um, we're going to be making ourselves more resilient um, for the long term as an overall community, as an agricultural community, um, and as a community of, of water users um, wherever we are. And so um, I think the key thing um, as we're looking at um, longer term changes related to climate change um, is the fact that um, by, by embracing this more collaborative um, approach and this more holistic approach, we're going to be able to become more resilient um, as a community. And I think that's um, that might be the change um, in thinking that some landers, landowners might have to, to have because they think that historically um, there's, there might have been this mindset that um, there are competing needs um, for water and, um, and as agricultural users, we need to do what we can to kind of preserve our usage of that water. Um, but longer term, if we're, if we're um, needing to um, bolster the health of our entire ecosystem for the long-term resiliency of um, our communities and, and agricultural in general, um, we need to be thinking about how we can have these more innovative collaborative approaches um, and how um, that water, um, water savings um, mindset can get us there in the long run. Yeah, thank you. One of the questions that's coming in too from um, Bruno, uh, Roger or Dan, do you have a comment on um, how, to what extent other agricultural industries are, are addressing these kinds of questions and, and working on these sorts of issues as well? I suspect they are. I don't have particular examples. I could point to an industry as such. Mm -hmm. It's usually individuals and it's usually companies and it's usually regions in the world, not an entire industry per se. So I think you'll see pockets um, of, of people wanting to do these things rather than by an industry basis. Well, and Dan, you know, you've done work like, for example, with the Yurok tribe um, on these issues, but do you have examples from other agricultural industries as well? Um, yeah, you know, there's a really good example in California Central Valley with some of the rice farmers and uh, collaboration with uh, Caltrout and, um, they call it the Nigeri, uh, the Nigeri project, where uh, you know they raise salmon in uh, rice fields and trying to mimic some of this, uh, you know, historic uh, floodplain wetland uh, habitat that was so productive for so many resources. Uh, I think it's a really good example of what I talked about earlier about uh, you know just maximizing beneficial uses yeah. on, on property, finding that win-win-win, multiple wins for everybody. Um, I, I have a, I, I agree with Roger. I think it happens um, with individuals and maybe local communities of industries, uh, whatnot. Um, and it probably varies across the landscape. Yeah, yeah, from so, what I, oh, go for it. Well, I just was going to say I, I have seen individual examples of various landowners doing this kind of work as well, and and so we we should remember that's a small scale effort, which is really important and valuable and becomes key examples for the rest of us. But I would like to yet again, put a charge to the media and the trade who are here watching that the more that we keep bringing this conversation back and asking questions about these issues, the more that we will be bringing um, reminders to producers and to other industries that this is something we can care about. You know, so just remember that, like as as uh, people working in wine, we have a unique voice to influence those around us and, and we can use that power to make positive change. Roger, one of the things that you said to me, though, that has completely blown my mind and like changed how I think about wine growing around the world is just the very simple point that 
you know, every wine region in the world gets their water from one of two things, rainfall or snow melt. So Mendocino, I mean, Mendoza, uh, Mendoza is essentially an entirely snow melt based wine region, you know, and the, the water comes melting out of the, like just pouring out of the mountains. They have this robust water management system through the region that is all based on capturing and directing water from snow melt. And then a place like Australia, the wine regions at least essentially are entirely rainfall based. But the reason this matters is because the storage the like avail when water is available where you get it from how you can use it and how you need to store it all changes based on when this is california is unique in that the inland areas um, are primarily snow melt based water versus our coastal areas are primarily rainfall based water so california is unique in that we have this kind of hybrid of the two but talk to us about why this matters and what we as individuals need to know based on if we're in a snow melt versus a rainfall region. Um, so very quickly, the, the California one's good, but it, again, it is elsewhere in the world. The difference is the timing. So when, when the snow melts, it's typically in spring. So if you were in Washington state or you're in the Central Valley and you will look at the, the inflow to river systems or coming, it comes in spring with snow melt. Whereas if it was in rainfall, that would be typically in what we call rainfall year, midwinter, um, December, January. And so when you would have the ability to put deposits in the bank differs. And uh, the systems that affect snow, uh, it's a little bit different than they are from the ones that affect rainwater. So, so um, and the challenge is when we start having big regions and big uh, agencies like in California, um, you've got both. So in some cases, you can make a better argument. We should be managing these as sub-districts because of their needs, not as a state representation or a federal agency because there's all these subsets. So it's the localness that's important in right. management and practices. Um, so things that work in the Central Valley often don't work in the coast. Um, pouring lots of water to flood irrigate almonds in projects in Central Valley and percolating it down is very different from putting that same amount of water into um, higher clay soils, less permeable in certain valleys on the coast. So it is a good practice. It does work there, but we've got to understand the, the site nature is what works and what doesn't. And the timing is the other one. So the implications of snow melt in spring for say fish, uh, compared to if there had been rainfall runoff in winter, uh, again, slightly different. So, yeah. um, but the, as you go around the world, that, that changes. And uh, some people have a mix of both. Mm -hmm. Well, and so again, that point about how local these issues are is really important. Like we can learn the, the kind of some of the big key picture things, but we need to, and that's came up last time too. We need to remember that in many cases, the solution has to be local. The management has to be local and the, and the impact is very local as well. So we have to remember that. But, um, you know, Katie, you mentioned earlier though that, that, you know, your family and the business has been working to kind of take advantage of these storm events. So again, like in the coastal areas here in California, but also Willamette Valley, um, Willamette Valley is maybe a little bit of a mix, um, snow melt and rainfall. But again, the, you've been working to capture um, these high rain events in reservoirs, but you've also been working on evaporation because that's something too, right? Over the course of the year, there's some water loss from reservoirs. So can you tell us a little bit more about efforts we can keep in mind as we're trying to think about, about storage and, and preservation of that? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so we uh, we are um, we do have a, a lot of reservoirs on our properties to capture the rainfall during the um, high rainfall events, and um, I think as, as things get um, hotter and drier, one of the things that we are going to have to um, better understand is how we can reduce um, uh, evaporation um, from our reservoirs. Um, we are um, looking at a trial right now. Um, to um, test out whether there's um, some way we can um, place something um, on our reservoirs to minimize um, the overall evaporation that occurs. Um, and 
Um, that's still very preliminary, but that's something that we're going to be exploring um, as one of our um, trials in the next couple of years to see um, if we can have um, an impact on, on how much water we actually lose from our, our reservoirs. Um, but I think that's also why um, groundwater recharge is so important. Um, I think that um, longer term groundwater recharge might be the, the right solution because um, if we are putting the water down in the, the aquifer um, and saving it, um, you don't have to worry about that um, evaporation, um, evaporative loss um, from your reservoir. So overall your resilience might be greater. Um, and um, right now we, we, I talked a little bit about the La Crema trial, but um, we're currently um, talking with some of our neighbors in Alexander Valley and also working with um, Sonoma Water on, um, on what we can do um, in that particular region, um, and, which does have soil types that are um, conducive to, um, to groundwater recharge um, to a greater degree than in other locations um, so that we can um, hopefully be able to work together um, to, as a community to help um, bolster that groundwater um, basin. Um, and then I, I'd say there are other things that we're doing um, to really become more water resilient in the vineyards. Um, we, as we think about development of um, vineyards, replanting of vineyards um, going into the future, we're looking at how we can plant with more drought um, tolerant rootstocks. Um, so more vigorous rootstocks that can go down deeper um, into the soil to look for water. Um, and we're, we're um, exploring other um, farming techniques to try to um, minimize the amount of water we need to use um, in our vineyards in the first place. And um, I talked about drip irrigation. That's something that we, um, we've we moved to um, across the board. Um, we um, also look at things like how we can use um, wind machines for, um, for frost events. Um, which is great because if you have um, a wind machine, it doesn't work in every single um, situation, but nine times out of 10, um, it completely takes away the need to use um, water for, um, for frost protection. So um, you can really minimize the amount of water you're using um, in those situations as well. Um, and, uh, and then um, I think the other um, piece of it that is the winery piece. Um, and so um, one of the things we've done um, at some of our wineries, including our La Crema wineries, we put in place these um, rainwater capture systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, to that concept of um, taking the water when it's um, plentifully available, um, we have um, these um, water catchment systems put in place um, and we're using um, our tanks that we aren't actually um, in need of anymore because um, harvest and fermentation is over. Um, we're using those as our storage vessels um, for the water. And um, in one of our wineries, um, we are able to actually depend upon rainwater in normal um, winters. Um, unfortunately, not, not every year will be the same and this year is an exception to that. Um, but um, in years that we have normal rainfall or more than um, average rainfall, um, we're seeing that we can um, use uh, only 40% of the water we need to use in the winery needs to come from other sources. 60% of it's coming from that rainwater capture system. Um, and we're able also to reuse it um, multiple times in our wineries as we've gotten more efficient. Um, so um, that's, well, a, that's a big win. Yeah, I love that example too that you were just starting to allude to. Uh, you know, I know um, one of the things that I have really been impressed by is I've kind of gotten to learn more about the different efforts that are happening um, in your winery specifically. But Kendall Jackson, as an example, has actually implemented a, a innovative barrel washing program that allows the water to be used up to three times. And we're going to talk about um, why that's appropriate with Roger more in a minute here. But one of the things that I was impressed by is that this is actually an innovation that has come from the employees themselves and that that has radically reduced water use at Kendall Jackson. So could you tell us more about that barrel washing program and how it's had such a positive impact and why you're able to reuse the water effectively? Yes. Um, so yeah, that's a great example of, um, of some um, innovation that came from, um, from our teams in the cellar itself in collaboration with the Tom Beard company. Um, so um, I think uh, one of the points um, that I'd like to make is that 
Um, we've been um, incentivizing our winery teams to try to win this winery um, water um, wise winery award every year. And um, as um, as each winery has had this challenge, um, people have gotten really inspired by it and really into it. And so they've come up with a lot of um, really interesting um, techniques to um, conserve and reuse water that um, would never have occurred to our sustainability team. Um, so mm -hmm. it's it's wonderful because it's um, really tapping into um, the knowledge and um, the expertise of our of our teams. And um, one of those things was the barrel wash water um, system um, that um, was uh, pioneered at our Monterey Kendall Jackson um, Winery. And um, the uh, technology um, was developed to take water, um, the water that we use to wash our barrels um, and reuse it three times. Um, so we're, we're really um, reducing the amount of water needed um, for that barrel sanitizing um, portion of our, our winery operations. Um, and that's a, a big um, thing for us um, in particular because 93% uh, of our our wines um, at Kendall Jackson are barrel fermented. And so um, it's, it's something that we've done to um, preserve quality and, and to um, actually elevate quality over the years. Um, and we've done it from the beginning, but it means that we um, historically have had to use a lot of water to wash those barrels. So um, having this um, technology um, that we can now um, use um, within our wineries to reuse that water three times um, really makes a big impact on our overall water use um, as a company. And um, that uh, particular um, uh, innovation um, happened at our Monterey facility, but we've since um, utilized this technology at, at other wineries and we're um, looking to scale that up across our organization um, in the next um, 10 years so that we can continue to build on those water savings um, as a company. It's such a great example though, too, of how, if, you know, as as a sustainability group or a director of sustainability, of course, you know, a person in that position is going to have ex expertise across need and across like under, better understanding what sustainability really looks like in practice. But your example really shows that in order for these efforts to work and in order for innovation to happen, you have to actually empower employ employees to care about these issues and then find solutions to address them. And I love how you've effectively used the competitive spirit as an asset to create solutions, innovation, and collaboration. But, you know, I have to say, I, I am certain a bunch of people are saying, okay, wait a minute, how can you just casually reuse water three times? Surely that's not okay. And Roger, you are the perfect person to ask to address this. One of the things you're really passionate about is this idea of water quality and how that plays into thinking in terms of water value and that that actually means, no, it really is appropriate to reuse water in multiple steps. So could you talk us through how to better understand that and then how to actually think about using it in our own lives and in our wineries? Sure. So the first point is that um, no pathogens can grow in wine. So at alcohol and pH that we have, uh, I don't believe there's ever been an example of a pathogen, which would be something that we'd be worried about in a food system and a cleaning system, um, being present in barrels or tanks that had wine in them. So we've effectively eliminated pathogens by making wine. So now if we rinse a barrel, the wine residue and the water that's going to be in contact it isn't going to pick up some uh, E. coli or not the terrible um, in, in, um, contamination from the surface, like it would perhaps in dairy or it would perhaps in other products. Right. So, so let me clarify one thing really quick that when you say pathogen, oh, yes, of course, we understand certain bacteria can grow like, like um, Brett or, or VA or something like that. But the point is that those are not actually harmful to humans. They're not a pathogen. That's and right. that's the distinction you're making. So right. actual harmful pathogens cannot grow in wine. And yeah. so we eliminated that worry. Okay. Yeah. Staphylococcus, strep, um, uh, E. coli, things that we would be worried about in a health system and in a food chain system. We're not, they're not in the barrels we're washing. That's the first piece. The second is that's also true in tanks. So if we can use water and recover it and reuse it in a, the next barrel, 
and we're not worried about the microbial load, the question is, can we do the same kind of thing for a stainless steel tank? And now it might be overnight, but we've got the ability to actually sterile filter it, not with chemistry, sterile filter it to use the same tank or a different tank tomorrow. So you just so, run it through a filter. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah. that's again, back to um, what would that take? That would take investments. Well, the thing we haven't really touched on is a value system for water, where if, if rainwater was the ultimate and was 10 times more valuable than um, groundwater with hardness, uh, where along that scale is the value of the water we're talking about? Because as we go from very high purity water to less desirable water, there has to be a price function in order to drive the investment and the understanding of why you would use this water and capture it and invest in the equipment and the technology to do that. So the space station is a good example. Um, they weren't limited by money, but that technology has been known and established for 30 years in, in that environment. I don't believe there's been an example of either bacterial pathogen or viral disease transmission in water systems in the space station uh, since its existence. Oh, so the other, we should we could clarify actually fill... that in the space station, it's a fully contained system reliant on water reuse, including yep. for consumption. That's right. And there have been no incidents in over 30 years of a fully contained system relying on water use, including for consumption. There That's have right. been no incidents of illness caused by the water system. To my knowledge, you know, I don't have access to the secrets of NASA, but I think there would have been that people would speak up about that if that had been a case. So the point is, you can do that. And the question now is, what would it take to do that? And, and as I said, we've done the barrel example now with the tank example. But every time you can use the water again, even a fraction of it, even if, if only 80 percent of the water that was used in the first tank or barrel could be used in the second one, and 80 percent of that could be used in the third one, um, depending on your operations and today, how many times you can use it, and depending on your storage and overnight use, um, how many times you can use it. But it, it's diminishing the water you need, and it's diminishing the water you're going to discharge as wastewater. And the even treated wastewater that would meet the drinking water standards is going to be a lower value than the rainwater you started with. So um, the question is, the more you can reduce that kind of water, and the more you can use this kind of water several times, that's the economic argument for doing it. Right. So the idea then, would be to, to preserve the highest value water for consumption. That's right. And then any lower value water. So obviously already used water, as an example, filtered water, those would be lower value effectively than then I think a lot of people don't realize that the purest water is rainwater. We're so used to thinking we have to get it from a tap for it to be clean, but yep. actually rainwater is the, does not, cannot have growth in it and it is the purest water. So if we, the more we can preserve the best water for consumption and then reuse everything else effectively, we'll actually reduce our water use overall as well. Right. The second feature which it touches on is the sense of having a dual water system. One which is quite pure for drinking water standards and another one which is for washing pavements and clothes and showering and flushing toilets. Mm -hmm. Those should be very different criteria. The problem we have in community systems is we want to do everything as drinking water standard, so it doesn't make a lot of sense of, of flushing toilets with drinking water standard water. So, But it would require a retrofit to actually build that dual system. In future wineries, in future buildings, we should be building a dual system. Yeah, this is the challenge we have in wine is we have to work with the system we have, yep. but, but every time we build a new building or plant a new vineyard, aim towards like building for what we know and need 20 years down the road, you know, yeah. so, um, and even at home, simple things like, um, you know, keeping a, this might sound inconvenient, but I know lots of people that do it, keeping a capture bucket in the shower. So if, when the water is being used in the shower, you have a capture bucket and then people, people use that you know you could use it in your garden but you could also use it to flush the toilet because we don't need drinking water for flushing toilets as an example yeah. but so but these, so many of these things have been adopted in other parts of the world mm -hmm. in 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 years long before current so we could learn if we, we would go looking we could find all of those examples 
Yeah, and so Cape Town in South Africa is a great example of an entire city that has had to really severely face these questions and come up with um, kind of municipal solutions, but we can work on individual solutions as well. And I know, Katie, you mentioned briefly earlier, and I want to make sure it gets highlighted that at, at La Crema, you've actually instituted a rainwater capture system on the rooftops, and then that rainwater is funneled into the storage tanks inside the winery so that you can use that for um, winery cleaning and, and things like that before, because fermentation doesn't happen from till months, months later. And so that's a, that's a kind of local winery example. Can you tell us just a little bit more about how you've been able to do that? Sure. Yeah. So we, um, we put in place um, the system on the roof to, to capture the rainwater um, when it comes and then it, we channel it into our tanks um, and um, one of the things that Roger just said, um, which um, is valuable for us in the winery as well, is um, because it's rainwater, it's, we don't need to really treat it um, to the same level that we would need to treat anything else. And we can use it in our cooling systems and we can use it to, um, to wash um, our cellar floors, for instance. Um, so we can do things with it um, that, um, that we... Uh, might not be able to do um, right away with other um, types of water. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's just a really great way to be um, a little bit more resilient as a winery um, that um, we are able to, um, to have that ability to capture water um, and, and minimize our impacts on the groundwater table um, or um, other um, sources of water, um, which might become more constrained as we um, go forward. Yeah, and so the, the point that's coming up in the chat too that Mark has made is basically like these technologies are in place. And I take it that's, yeah. that was Roger's point with the space station example. These technologies are all in place, but we need to actually get motivated to utilize them and integrate them into our homes and into our winery buildings and things like that. And, but at the same time, we can also innovate new technologies and new uses for established ones. And Katie, one of the things I wanna be sure we mentioned too is that sometimes we can reuse, reduce water use by using something else instead. And I know at both La Crema and Fremark Abbey, you've been able to bring UV light in place of water in some cases. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, so we have a, um, we're using a technology called Blue Morph um, and it's a, a UV light to sanitize our tanks. Um, and this is towards the end of the, um, our, the fermentation period. Um, so for the, the last sanitation of the tanks, um, after we've completely um, finished um, using them, um, we use this blue morph technology instead of um, having to use water um, with chemicals um, in a solution um, to sanitize. Um, and that's um, beneficial because it reduces the amount of um, chemicals that we need to use that we then um, are putting into our um, ponds for treatment, but also um, it just reduces the overall amount of water um, we need to use to sanitize um, those tanks at the end of um, fermentation. Um, and um, it saves about 300 gallons of uh, fresh water um, from being used uh, per tank. So it's, um, it's pretty significant it's when, you, um, when you add it all up, especially if you're using um, this one um, UV um, light sanitation um, uh, unit um, for a, a larger scale winery. Um, and we're able to do that at La Crema um, in particular. That's great, thank you. And Roger, in designing the um, Jess Jackson Sustainable Winery Building, you, you know, there at UC Davis, you actually integrated um, this point about rainwater capture. Oh, I'm not sure if he's still, oh, uh, you are, okay, good. <laughs> I wanted to make sure the connection was still working. So, uh, but you were able to integrate rainwater capture into the actual structure and, and building of the winery from its, from its founding. Yes. And, and you actually took a very strong view on this. One of the key takeaways I want everybody to remember, you know, if you remember nothing else from this session, remember that we have to be thinking about water conservation, even in rain years, right? We can't only think of it in drought years. We have to plan around these issues in rain years as well. And Roger, this is the work that you did in helping to establish the sustainable winery there you know, so tell us more about what you what you've done there for water conservation and how rainwater plays a role. 
Uh, quickly, yes. So just some of the chat comments have been about um, putting solar panels on on reservoirs to stop evaporation. Okay, what I call um, water and energy at the same place. Um, the roofs of the winery building and the Jackson building were intentionally designed to be both solar collector areas and rainwater collection zones. Same thing, two, two functions, not a water collector and not a solar roof, same thing. So in the future, we have to build wineries where, and buildings where that is the model. Um, and that's what those buildings are. At the time, uh, we, we chose to use um, um, basically four storage rainfall tanks on the winery. And that allowed us to capture surface water and groundwater runoff, groundwater off concrete um, into water that was used for landscape and toilet use. So non-potable water put the winery off the grid for non-potable water uh, the day it was built. That's part of the lead uh, argument. The Jackson building allowed us to put another six rainwater storage tanks. These look like corrugated iron uh, grain silos. People think they're storing for pallets or grain for the brewing program. They're actually, no, they're water tanks for the winery. That's three years water supply in a place that gets 18 inches a year in, in old terms. Well, and that's desert conditions. 18 well, inches dry, right? low, relatively low rainfall. So the intention for the design was to be able to take the rainwater, filter it to reverse osmosis grade, use it to clean tanks and refilter it each night for the next day's use. So we wanted to use water multiple times, but we wanted to start with almost sterile water. So there was no chemistry in this cleaning sequence. Um, we have three years rainwater uh, storage. People said to me, um, one year we had a high rainfall and the water, the tanks were full and the water was overflowing. And people said, well, um, look, you've got all the water you possibly need. Why are you still storing the water? And the answer is for the years when it doesn't come out the top and the years which are this year, for example, is the kind of year where we would have, if it had been fully completed, we would have been washing our tanks with the water from two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so we've got one, that's the banking. We've got to build the storage pieces into the design of the structure. So if you were to come and visit and look or look on Google at that facility, the first thing you'll see is the roofs and the second thing you'll see is the water tanks. And so it's taking water from an adjacent, the Institute roof, to store, to filter it to the level that would be on the space station. That's not just bacteria, that's all viruses and all secondary chemistries. Everything is removed. Mm -hmm. So this is very sterile water. And well, because it's so valuable, we actually want to capture it there was a reference in the Q and A about grey water. What we're talking about is water that does not hit the ground. What we're talking about is recaptured cleaning water, which is refiltered and new used for cleaning. We're not taking grey water and trying to clean it up. We're trying to prevent the formation of grey water, and therefore be able to use cleaning water multiple times in a very sterile condition, because that's what most of our water use is. Right. So again, so first step is to build storage, to build a capture system of the, for the rain itself and have it funnel into a storage system. One of the comments you made to me when we were talking previously that I think is so brilliant is like, people like to ask, yeah, but how much does that cost? If you're talking about your own home and investments in something like um, renewable energy or, or water capture in your own home and somebody wants to ask how much did that cost? Did, did anyone ask them, when is your kitchen remodel going to pay for itself? We don't ask those questions on aesthetics. Why are we asking them on our own ability to sustain ourselves? You know, if we're asking about cost and return, shouldn't we be asking on mere aesthetic issues rather than on literal resilience and sustenance issues? But so, and then, so the first step again is build in an ability to get the rainwater put it into storage, but then a, a future step that people can think towards is also how do we capture water that we've used in order to filter to reuse in certain yeah. conditions. So that's like a long-term aim that we can keep in mind. And so it's what of the, again, part of the chat discussion is on return on investment and financial. If we had a value on the water system, that would pay for itself. Right. The fact that we don't have a value on a water system, we just look at what we can get it for. There is no ROI to conserve or to do other things. 
So we've got to come to the realization of water value and put a price on it. And we can do it internally or we can do it as a community, but we've got to do that. Otherwise you can't talk about the investment in saving water because there's, that's just a volume argument. Right. Uh, we're talking about a quality argument and a, a premium argument. So again, we're talking about shifting from thinking of water in terms of mere value count to yep. instead thinking about quality and value, quality of water, pure water versus reused water versus gray water. Those are three very different things. Yes. And, and then those would also have different values and so be, would generate a different economy of water, essentially. Right. And at each so, step, when we do something that downgrades the water, there should be a financial penalty for doing that if you had a value system. Right. If you don't have a value system, that doesn't matter. So we can't get rid of bad practices without a value system for water. And we can't look at investments and work out what their value is because we don't have a value for water. So this so, is fundamental to right. being able to fit it into improvements in the future. So the truth is currently we do not have this kind of setup in our own communities, but we can be keeping these lessons in mind to think about how we value water in our own homes and how we value water in our wineries and in our businesses. And so Dan, though, making this point again, that we need to be thinking about these issues, even in um, wet years, not just in drought years, what is your advice on how can someone bring these lessons forward to think about all the time and to think about long term, rather than only in a drought? Yeah, you know, I think that's a, uh, I, I think we need to think that um, just accept, you know, accept a common understanding that the climate that we've had in the past is not uh, what, what we'll have in the future. That That's kind of a flawed assumption. And, you know, just in, you know, um, you know, tackling water issues over the last 20 years, uh, what we've seen is, is, uh, and water availability analysis is that we've never gotten water every single year, 100% all the time. There's always been like one or two years where water was short. And, um, you know, pre-2010, everybody would always point to the 1977-76 drought where nobody got water. And I think if we really look back at the last 10 years, that ratio of eight to 10 years of getting water has changed significantly. Uh, within the past 10 years, we've seen some of the worst droughts uh, that California has ever seen. And we've also seen the wettest year on record. And so our, our ability, it's been extremes. That's, that's all been in the one definition. decade, yeah. All in one decade. And that is, um, that's enough to really think about uh, water management every single year because we've seen those extremes and I think what uh, Roger and, and Katie have both touched on and I, I, I fully export, uh, support is you know the need to think about you know reusing reusing water uh, multiple times and also you know think about it in the context of carryover storage and, and that's similar to water banking is like now that we've got water you know, we should plan on using it for several years because we don't know when it will come down again. Um, I, I, I think there's a, a, a decent chance that, um, you know, there could be uh, times in the future where we can go as much as 12 months without seeing precipitation. In fact, we've gotten close to that within the past decade, very little water in a 12 month period. Um, so when, when, when it comes, it, we could, should expect for it to uh, come a lot in floods and uh, we need to be able to capitalize on those moments because if we don't, it may be a very long time before we see it again. So one of the challenges of this conversation is that um, the reality of water is that it's big scale and it demands big solutions. And so sometimes I know for me personally, that can feel overwhelming. And sometimes it feels like, I don't know what I can do as a person. Um, but some of these examples, we're trying to ensure that businesses, that landowners um, have examples of things they can do. In the long term, integrating greater storage capacity into your buildings is a crucial um, step. But also thinking, you know, for landowners, thinking about banking um, in reservoirs, but also literally in the land itself is a really important step. 
Um, but I want to make sure that we address some of the things like what can each of us do as individuals? Kim gave us a re great reminder, again, climate scientist from Sweden who was in the carbon session. She reminded us that one of the most powerful things that we can do as individuals too is to vote and to be having conversations with our representative across all aspects of, of um, local to national to international um, around policy to ensure these things are being taken care of. So keep that in mind as well. That's an individual point. But I want to make sure and ask, you know, so um, each of you, you know, Roger, Dan, and Katie, if you had one piece of advice for something for all of us to keep in mind going forward to, to try to improve these things and keep this stuff in mind, you know, what, what would you um, recommend? You know, Dan, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Yeah, so uh, I, I think... I think the greatest thing we could do, water management um, in the West, at least Western United States, has always been very controversial. And um, the dialogue has not always been productive, but solutions are born out of a uh, productive dialogue. And, um, you know, I think back on, um, you know, Katie and her family when they approached us uh, NOAA Fisheries on, on Kellogg Ranch about trying to find a better way for uh, water management and, and habitat out there. Um, that um, was a productive dialogue and a great first step. So my, if I could leave one message with, with everybody here is that, uh, you know, start a dialogue with um, your local resource agency or nonprofit um, dealing with water, uh, I think what you'll, if you do that, I think what you'll find is there's a lot of common ground to be had and it takes a lot of work to get through that. Uh, but at the end, uh, we can maximize beneficial uses and um, have, have a better system in place. Yeah, thank you. Roger, do you have a key takeaway? Um, measurement and real time measurement. So you need to have a water meter. You need to be able to see what the water usage as it is going right now. And you need to know what it is year to date. And you perhaps want to know what it was last year or some five year average. So if you don't know those three numbers, I'll suggest you can't manage water very well this year. Um, it's ironic that I, on my phone, can look at the power meter on my house. But I can't look at the energy, water, right. but I can't look at the water meter, even though I have a water meter 20 feet from my front door. So that's a that's a, a, a time warp of access to a meter. The second question is in agriculture, we typically don't have meters. Now the question is when when are we going to have them? Because we'll need them to manage the water footprint, the water balance, and our own uses and practices on our own side. We'll need that number. So that's critical. And there shouldn't be an argument about do you have water meters or you don't want water meters. It should be about, I've got the water meter and I'm using it. We can talk about where the data goes and what other people want. But that's got to be embedded in our thinking, I think, going forward. Yeah, thank you. So one of the key things that came up in the carbon session was just that simple point that we're getting better tools to monitor our own carbon footprints. And um, groups like International Wineries for Climate Action, for example, have, are creating um, carbon calculators so that smaller producers that might not have as, the resource access to paying someone to help calculate these things will have an easier ability to do that. So that's an example of people using the capital they have to make things easier for the um, for the smaller producer and individuals as well, which is really important. But I take it part of Roger's point is that moving forward, we have to also be thinking in terms of water footprints and that that's relevant worldwide. And um, one of the things I want to remind everybody is that we are in a decade of action. We must be acting now. Part of the point of this series is to educate each other and to be pushing ourselves to think harder and come up with more immediate solutions individually and collectively. And um, going forward, thinking in terms of water footprint is something we can start to integrate into the conversation because it's really not been part of the conversation so far. So thank you for that. Katie, is there a key takeaway that you want to be sure people have as well? Um, yeah, I think what I would say my key takeaway is um, is to, to build on um, what we've already been talking about in terms of um, our current reality and, and what the reality is going to be going forward. Um, I think that um, it 
it is the reality that water is going to be scarcer um, in many years than it has ever been before. And then we're going to have um, more of it than we know what to do with at certain times of the year. And so for us to, to just be aware of that um, and start to be very proactive in how we plan for um, how we can capture and store um, and manage water um, so that we are looking forward um, not only to how we're using water this year, but also how we're looking at how we're using water five years from now or 10 years from now is really important. And, um, and these are really thorny, difficult issues. And I think that um, similar to climate change, um, there was some dialogue on that um, panel that um, no one um, person, no one um, organization can can um, tackle these things alone. Um, we all need to be collaborative and we all need to be, um, as we're adapting to um, new conditions and new realities, I think we're going to have to continue to um, be innovative and, and educate ourselves about the best path forward. And um, I would just um, say that I think it's important for us to be thinking about water management um, from the bigger picture. Um, and I think there are things that um, we all can do, whether it's on the individual, individual level or it's on the vineyard or winery level. Um, and um, I would just encourage um, all of us in the wine community too, to reach out to each other, um, mm -hmm. to collaborate on these um, issues because together we can do more than we can um, one by one. And, um, and with resiliency in mind, um, it, it really is um, so important for the long-term um, health of our community um, and the, the wider community too, to make sure that we are, um, we are working on these problems and coming up with some innovative solutions. So. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I really believe that the key cultural change we're in the midst of is, is recognizing that community building is essential to success for any of us. And, and so I really appreciate you speaking to that point. Um, so I wanna be sure we address some of the Q&A that has come in. Um, one of the things that's come up is there's a question about um, certifications and, and the extent to which they do or do not demand water. There, each, in, each certification has um, different requirements. And I know that some of the links to some of those has gone into the chat. So I, I think it's actually um, fairest to defer to the individual certifications and allow them to answer, so to speak, because they do each have different requirements. Some do specifically address water and, and some um, don't because they have a different focus. So it's, it would be important to allow that answer to come from certifications themselves. But I encourage anyone to feel free to contact those who do oversee different certifications to ask these kinds of questions because it's important to have those conversations. Um, Roger, a question that's come in from Noel is simply, you know, as, you know, in different years with different weather conditions or with changing climate conditions, if a place like the Sierra Foothills was to receive rain um, at certain times of year versus um, the snowfall fall that we were talking about, does that necessitate a change for managing um, or beneficially um, capturing water from an area like that? I think it does. It requires, there'll be years when you have more rain and there'll be cries when you have more snow. So if you're in an area where both of those are important to the balance, you probably need to be able to manage both and account for the case where you don't have as much snow this year. What would you do more in terms of local banking and rainwater versus what could you have as snowpack and expect to see it in spring? So that's, a, that's like um, managing a check account in terms of something has come up and or this isn't there it was there last year at the start of school but this year it's not one of those fees it comes up in winter quarter or something or other so it's a that's a management thing that's what i come back to the check account and the financial statement and the bank account piece so um that's knowing so what works for you in the foothills with both of those is going to be different from the people on the coast and people who are perhaps only feeding out of oroville and snowmelt mm -hmm. so um it's back to uh, yes, uh, but what is your water source? And you'll need to have both. Um, the only comment I'd make, not by Foothill, but for this year, which I think is very interesting, is that for various reasons, the state of California, I would say, was very late in determining and declaring a drought. And the answer is companies and individuals, if they'd had their own weather stations and own rainfall to capture data, would have realised the drought is there by November, December. 
before we, yeah before we even we got into saying, the rain system yeah the yeah. question is would you invoke what we would call drought strategy by mm -hmm. december not wait until april march and someone else declares it and says it's a drought and now we want water restrictions so when will we be ahead of the curve because larger organizations will be relatively late to do those declarations and it's the local problem and it's the local answer so we've got to we've got to think more about our our own localness of deciding on these things and the drought when you will declare a drought is a very important one right and the, the idea of declaring a drought or not in spring is based on a very old climate model when weather cycles were more reliable yep. and so waiting to see was appropriate but because it's changed so significantly as dan was talking about in the beginning we actually can't anticipate rain volume so to speak right. before the rain season and we need to be doing that in order to appropriately manage our water use yeah thank you um so one of the um so Lynn and Mark are asking about kind of uh, footprint and need in terms of irrigation. We're going to, um, we'll talk about kind of farming questions more in the second session, but Katie, do you want to just revisit, you had made the point that you're, um, you know, one of the really effective things to do is as vineyards are, are redeveloped, we can be thinking in terms of drought resistant rootstock, but also, you know, your family has made a point of kind of really strategically managing irrigation in order to minimize water need in vineyards. Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, yeah, so we, um, we're looking at drought resistant um, uh, rootstocks. Um, we're also using um, uh, soil moisture probes in the, in the soil to um, tell us um, more so that we can be a little bit more strategic about um, when and for how long we need to irrigate. And we're also um, really embracing um, deficit irrigation. So giving the, the vines a little bit less than um, we might historically have thought they needed. Um, and if you do that, um, to uh, a, just a, a certain level, um, you can actually improve quality. So um, those are three things that we've done um, in the last, um, I'd say five years, um, as we're thinking about how we can um, become a little bit better about um, our water use in the vineyard. Um, and I think there might have been another part to your question, Elaine. Um, no, I just was making the comment that we'll talk about some of these things more in, in the next session. All right. about farming. Yeah. Um, yeah, to that point, um, the next session's on uh, transitioning to regenerative farming. And, and um, actually, that's one other thing that we're um, hoping is going to be um, a beneficial uh, byproduct of transitioning to using more compost. And um, that the fact that if you have more um, organic matter in your soils, um, there actually is better water holding capacity in the soils themselves. Um, so um, being able to build up your soil health um, is, is beneficial um, in the longer term. Um, we believe to uh, reducing irrigation um, needs as well, um, but that's something that we're, we're very much at, um, in the beginning stages of, and we're going to have to be monitoring um, and ground treating as we, as we move forward. But um, that's something that we're also excited about. Um, in terms of those practices. Um, and I think we'll get into that next time. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, one of the things we'll talk about more next time too is like soil health directly ties to both water holding and carbon holding capacity. And that also certain farming practices can actually help reduce the soil temperature, which also effectively re, um, reduces the water need and changes the ripening arc. So we'll kind of get into some of those things a little more as we go forward. But um, so one of the things though, too, um, just for every, everyone, and Dan, I can imagine you having some um, opinions about this specifically, but Mark is actually asking about, apparently Bill Maher um, uh, brought up the idea of having water pipelines. And when I was growing up, you know, I'm from Alaska and um, in the early nineties, the governor of Alaska at the time suggested that Alaska would do really well building a water pipeline to California. And, um, and apparently some people have brought this up, uh, this idea again from bringing water from other parts of the continent to California when we need. Any, um, any comments on the viability of that or if it's actually a, a good idea? Well, I, you know, pipelines in California um, are nothing new. Right. Uh, we have many basins that rely on water from other basins. You know, a local example, the, the Russian River draws a, a fair amount of water from the Eel River. 
And in the Central Valley, there's pipelines that go from the Trinity River to California uh, to the Central Valley. And there's the uh, the, uh, the longstanding North versus South uh, water battle uh, that, you know, I, I'm just using general terms uh, with water. I, I think um, I think when we, it, you know, so there's plenty of examples of bringing in water, but um, you know that it, that uh, it, it does it hasn't shown a uh, productive solution uh, to anything. It just makes the problem bigger, right? And um, it, it it doesn't it just solves the immediate need. I think um, if we're talking about sustainability in the long run, uh, I think we need to tackle these things at sort of a local level uh, within the local climate and, um, you know, think comprehensively about these solutions rather than make our problems, you know, geographically bigger and uh, more complicated. Well, because I take it a pipeline solution is thinking in terms only of water volume, not in terms of water solutions, actually. And so we need to shift to thinking in terms of comprehensive water systems and solutions at a local level. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So Roger, Jane is asking, you know, we've been talking about kind of water footprints. And so, um, and in some ways, the, I think the industry is still getting it, wrapping its head around this idea, but can you give us any kind of benchmark on terms of water use in relation to wine produced? And I know previously when you and I have talked, you have, um, one of the things that you said that helped me make sense of that quite a bit was the idea of water needed for beer versus water needed for wine, that there, there are kind of two different key ways you'd think about water need for that kind of production. Could you kind of lay that out for us and give us a clearer sense of that? Certainly. So in winemaking, in most cases, we don't add water back to the product. So in dehydration fruit, that's a, a, a accepted and allowed, but up to a limit. But essentially, we would make wine from non-water input. We use the I water... We use yeah, the water to wash and clean. Right. Because so the idea is even if you did add water to a tank, it's so it's a minimal amount. Sure. Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. It'd be a fraction, a fraction of the volume. Um, okay. If whereas when we're washing, we could actually use a multiple of that volume. So if we talk about liters of water per liter of wine is the footprint, but that's one way to look at it. There's two problems with that for water. The first is there are some components of it like barrels where whether you do one barrel or a hundred barrels, your methodology would give you the same amount of liter to water to liter to wine, because the size of the barrel doesn't change if it's all more barrels. So that's a, a normal footprint that people think of. It just grows by volume. If you're washing tank surfaces, stainless steel tanks for fermenters and storage tanks and blending tanks, that's a different problem. It's a different problem because we're washing the surface area and the surface area in proportion to the volume goes down as the tanks get bigger. Mm -hmm. So if I wash a small stainless steel tank and use a certain amount of litre of water to make a litre of wine in that small tank, and I take another tank, which is twice the diameter, eight times the volume, it's going to have four times the surface area. Okay, so we went up by eight in the volume, but we only went up by four in the cleaning requirement and the footprint will go down by a half. Not because of your practices or your efficiencies, just because of scale. Right. So the first problem is we've got a compounded footprint, some things that don't scale and some things that do scale, and we're gonna add them together. So one of the challenges then is people would say, well, larger wineries don't use as much water to wash a tank or to uh, their footprint is smaller and the answer is it should be because of scale effects not because of practices and we've got to understand the difference between that otherwise we'll be mistaken on what we think are good water practices so a large winery having a lower per liter volume does not necessarily mean they're more efficient that's right that's right yeah. it just says they have less surface area per liter to wash right and the geometry goes up, if you double the diameter, you will have the water footprint. So we so need to be thinking, looking at our water footprint in terms of efficient overall efficiency, not just numbers. That's right. And yeah. scalable. And the, and the challenge with that is many small wineries, actually, because of that scaling factor, have a large amount of surface to wash per litre of wine. And the barrel is probably the ultimate, where we've got more surface area, 
per litre than we actually do in a tank that we filled several barrels with. So the, the, the driver of efficiency, if we're truly to talk about a water footprint, is really got to be people with small um, winery volumes, small containers, large areas per litre. That's but, why. Yeah. That's, so trying to compare what a winery does that has fermenters that are, say, 10 feet diameter against wineries that have 20 or 50 feet in diameter. The question is, these ones will have half the water footprint to clean them, and this one will have a fifth of the water footprint to clean them but they're with, the very, with the very same practices. So you can't use the water footprint as a practice argument now. Right. Or an well, efficiency so... argument or a badge of honour. It's not. It's actually a scalable function that we've got to understand and different people will adopt across the scale. Now, that's difficult for people to understand because they're used to thinking that the more you use per unit, the less efficient you are. But actually, um, so like a great example here would be, again, Kendall Jackson Vintners Reserve is the number one selling Chardonnay in the United States, has been for more than 30 years. And Kendall Jackson has also implemented one of the highest efficiency standards for barrel washing in the United States. Yep. So the and subtlety, the subtle, if I just interrupt, the subtle important piece of that is what I just said. The worst case is a barrel. So they chose to adopt an improved cleaning method on the very worst example of water use. Well, or the greatest yeah. challenge would be the greatest challenge. Well, greatest a challenge. A barrel is the greatest challenge for efficiency, and and Kendall Jackson created a solution to come up with the highest efficiency standard in the industry right now for that greatest challenge. Yeah. So in the optimist world, you don't talk about challenges; you talk about opportunities. So it is the greatest opportunity, mm -hmm. and they seized it. And whereas many people would sit back and talk about the, the challenge and and why you can't do it. The answer is no. In in the solutions world, in the future world, we've got to talk about what is the opportunity to make something different and the metrics to do so. Well, so. And I love your point that smaller wineries have the greatest opportunity to drive our understanding of efficiency yep. as yep. well, yep. which is great. One of the things that, as a final comment just about Jackson family, one of the things I think people often misunderstand, they, in, properly speaking, Jackson family is a medium-sized producer with a bunch of small sized um, wine labels and wine brands. I think sometimes people think of Jackson family as being very large, but in actuality, Jackson family owns lots of small wineries that each make their own wine. And your point is that those small wineries can increase our understanding of efficiency. And, um, and, and what we just heard is in relation to water efficiency, Kendall Jackson's given us one with barrel washing. Right. Yeah. So, so the last point, if I could just quickly make it, yes, please. when we were building the winery at, 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 the, at the university, we were going to have fermenters for research, which were the same size as a barrel. In fact, a third of a barrel. So we do three replicates to fill a barrel. So we are three times worse off mm -hmm. in our water usage to build a new winery and the answer is this has to have solution recovery this has to show the world how to do it at the very small scale and that's implicit in that design yeah thank you so one more really fast question for you roger just you know the you talked about this incredible design and um like internal system for the um, sustainable winery at UC Davis is there a schematic available is the website the best place to look for insights yep. on that it probably is. There's some some of these things change with time. Uh -huh. So again, this was this was designed in 2006 to 2008. Those concepts were developed then before we actually began the actual design of the winery. So those in my world, those are old hat and a long time ago. Um, we've got some information on the website. If you were to look at it, go to the department's website, look under facilities, and there'll be um, the features of the winery and the, the Jackson Sustainable Winery Building. Um, if you were to just go to Google and put in um, Robert Mondavi Institute or um, a UC Davis and zoom in on the campus, you would see this building from the air. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you'll see is the panels, the roofs and the tanks. And you will say that's a rainwater building and that's what we're talking about.
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So we have um, taken plenty of time. I, I'm so grateful to everyone for your questions and for the chat for um, for staying on for this long. One of the things I, I you know, as, as a trade and media person myself in the wine industry, I like to remind my cohort that we have the incredible power to make hugely positive change. One of the things that Kim reminded us about in the first session was that a very small group of people can change what we believe is normal and standard and what our expectations actually are in the world. And so as powerful voices from the wine industry, we have a unique opportunity. Wine moves people. The romance of wine inspires people. As voices in wine, whether we are writing articles or whether we are talking to consumers tableside or in retail shops, we have the power to tell stories that motivate people to care about these issues. So I would like to encourage all of us to think in terms of how can we share this conversation? How can we bring this information for, forward in good earnest education for others who haven't had the opportunity to put this time in? Where is my opportunity to contribute? That's the invitation I'd like you to go forward with today. Where is my opportunity to contribute? One more story that I'd like to tell you about my personal life um, that I think plays into this that um, Roger encouraged me to share. As many of you know, I grew up in Alaska. I spent a third of the year on a very, in a very, very remote part of the world on the western coast of Alaska. One of the benefits of remote parts of the world is that people get very, very attuned to the exact resources that they have and exactly how to use them efficiently because it is not easy to simply bring in more supplies from elsewhere. And in researching and getting ready for this session today, one of the things that I realized was in, in um, that third of the year, whether it was summer or winter, we actually drank rainwater that my great grandparents gathered off the roof of, of both their garage and their home. They had um, barrels and tanks that they captured the water in. And anytime we needed drinking water or water for cooking, we simply went out to the rainwater uh, barrels and, and took some in, in um, pitchers and buckets back into the house. And that's what we used actually for food. The tap water, we did actually have a well, but the quality of it was far less and filtering systems were not standard at that point in time and certainly not in that part of the world. And so we actually used um, groundwater for washing dishes or washing clothes um, and and for other uses like that, but the drinking water was entirely rainwater. So even in this remote part of the world from um, fully Alaska native Inuit great grandparents who barely spoke English, it was simply understood that there were different qualities of water that must be respected for different needs. And the point of this story is that our solutions are already in place. This knowledge is already in place. It's just a matter of us getting motivated integrate these solutions into our daily lives and we all have the opportunity to contribute in that way today so i'd like to invite you again as you go forward into the rest of the day ask yourself how can i contribute today i uh, thank you again so much for being here i'm hugely grateful to to dan to roger to katie for all of your contributions today i have learned so much from thinking through this it's really changed my outlook on so many things and again thank you for all of to all of you for being here today Behind the scenes, there are already always so many people making these sessions happen. I'm so grateful for the entire team at Jackson Family um, for making this session go so smoothly and for allowing me to partner with you in um, bringing this conversation to the front. So thank you again to everyone. Um, and um, we'll see you in early October for a session on soil and farming.